you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amana Ferro. Thank you very much for uh, having the European Anti-Poverty Network here. I am um, a bit of a stand-in for uh, Sean Jones, who is our policy coordinator and who unfortunately, due to a clash of, of many commitments, could not be here. So I will be delivering this presentation um, in her stead. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, we've been following the uh, basic um, universal basic unconditional Ah, the U always gets me between unconditional and universal, because it should be both, shouldn't it? Um, the basic income initiative from, uh, from its start a couple of, uh, of years ago, and um, there are some points where the work of our organizations um, meets and others where it doesn't, but we're all fighting for the same goal. And I'm here to tell you a little bit from our perspective, what are the social challenges that Europe is facing and how adequate income can overcome those. And I'm going to briefly speak about both basic income and minimum income under the same umbrella of dignified income for all, adequate income support that allow people to lead, lead uh, dignified lives. So um, I'm going to quickly go through who we are, why adequacy of income support is important, um, a little bit about the two approaches, minimum income and basic income, a little bit about what we are doing um, more on minimum income and some conclusions. So the European Anti-Poverty Network is a um, network of NGOs committed to the fight against poverty for the last um, almost 25 years. We started in 1990, um, came out of the European Union's anti-poverty programs and the purpose is not just to work on behalf of people experiencing poverty but also together with them and bring them and their stories to the forefront. Uh, we receive financial support from the European Commission, this is the Secretariat in Brussels, whereas uh, we also have members on the ground, uh, 29 national networks in most countries of the European Union, as well as Serbia, Macedonia, Iceland and Norway. And what is a little bit particular about EAPN is that our national members are not just one organization per country, but actual anti-poverty platforms at the national level, bringing together a number of actors, social NGOs, trade unions, academics, etc. And we also have 18 European organizations as um, members, such as Caritas, such as uh, AGE, such as the European Network Against Racism, Eurochild, um, and others. And as I said, the participation of people with direct experience of poverty is, in our view, part of the solution. So it's not about experts speaking about people in poverty, but it's about people in poverty speaking about themselves, because they are the true experts. Um, income support. Why is income support even needed? And uh, it might be clear to everybody in this room, but it's a question that I've heard a lot of times because apparently not everybody believes that having adequate resources to lead dignified lives is indeed a fundamental right and that poverty is a denial of human rights insofar as an individual is not free to lead a life free from want and free from need and sometimes very basic needs. We live in rich societies, we are, Europe is definitely one of the richest regions in the world and it's unacceptable that anybody is left behind in such an economically prosperous region. Having the necessary means to participate both in the labor market and in society, to plan for a future, to raise a family, are essential attributes in our society that everybody should have access to. This is what we believe. We also believe that adequate income support uh, as social protection ensures that wages are also set at a decent level. Why? Because of something called incentives to work, which means that wages have to be higher than social protection. So if social protection schemes are set at an adequate level, at a level that allow people to, leave, to live in dignity, then wages, it automatically follows that wages would be higher than that level, so it, it is a backdoor push, if you want, to also ensure decent revenue from work. It is also a key tool to eradicate poverty and to ensure fairness and, and redistribution. Um, we have a strategy called Europe 2020, which has one of the overarching targets to reduce the number of people experiencing poverty in the European Union at least by 20 million by the year 2020. Since this pledge was taken uh, four years ago, 
the number of people experiencing poverty and social exclusion has risen tremendously in all countries of the European Union. We are now way behind the target. The ambition is no longer to reduce, starting from the benchmark of 2010, it's you know, at least to get back to, to, to those levels, because now over 125 million people in the European Union are experiencing poverty. And a quarter of people experiencing poverty are actually in work, which says something about the, the level of wages. The crisis is not an excuse. It is precisely in times of crisis that people should be sheltered and shielded from the um, toxic effects of financial deregulation. Cash transfers are a proven way of reducing poverty in any society. If you look at poverty rates before cash transfers and after cash transfers, the impact is, is absolutely clear. Income protection set at a decent level operates as an automatic stabilizer. It provides a social floor, which has now been recognized by the ILO. It has been recognized even by the word bank in their famous admission that austerity is wrong. It is, a, it is what ensures consumption. It is what ensures relaunching of the economy. You cannot afford to keep people in poverty. You cannot afford to deny people disposable income, not for their sake as individuals, not for society's sake, from both a, a solidarity and an economic point of view. So it is a key pillar of the economic social model, which unlike Mario Draghi, I myself think is not dead and shouldn't be dead and should be resuscitated. Also, when we speak about adequacy, a question that I get very often is, what is an adequate income? How do you calculate what constitutes a dignified life? When we say it's something that allows people to lead a life in dignity, what do we mean? What are essential needs? Who decides what is essential and what is not? Um, and also, how do you cater for different types of families? It's one thing to be single, it's something else to have dependents. Housing costs are what they are. Energy costs, energy poverty is a rampant phenomenon with people unable to adequately heat their homes, for instance. So there is a resolution of the European Parliament which says that the benchmark should be the risk of poverty line, which is 60% of median income. This is what is currently recognized by the European Union as the limit of poverty. So basically, if what we give people to live on is under that level, it's an effective condemnation to poverty of those people. It's a sanctioned by the state, it's okay to be poor. Um, another method of looking at it, it's the standard budgets approach, which means getting focus groups together to speak about a basket of essential goods and services which are needed for a life in dignity. And, and a number of, of these initiatives are, are already ongoing with the support of the European Commission. And what is very interesting is that if you have a focus group of people living in poverty and a focus group of people who are relatively well off, not rich, but just able to, leave, to live decently, um, the numbers that come out of the focus group of people experiencing poverty are always lower. They always think that a dignified life is something less than maybe us in this room think that constitutes a dignified life. And that for me is very interesting because we're not talking about greed, we're not talking about laziness, we're just talking about people who want their human rights fulfilled. Moving on to um, the distinction between minimum income and, and basic income. So minimum income, first of all, is means tested. It's the idea that um, people are sometimes unable to fend for themselves through work, for instance, and that protection, social protection, monetary support should be readily available for them either temporarily or permanently for the time that, that they need it. But it's means tested in the sense that it depends on the situation of the person and whether they are well off or, or not. Um, it being a, a, a question of, of, of resources. If we can't do it for everybody, let's at least start with those who need it the most. This is a little bit the, the reasoning behind support for minimum income. However, they might be different approaches, but they definitely share the same aim, which is provide adequate resources for people to participate in the labor market and in society throughout the life cycle, from childhood into old age. Um, everybody deserves to be sheltered from hardship. And this is, and ensuring adequate income is, is definitely a way to do it. 
both campaigns, both initiatives for um, minimum income or basic income are coming now under very heavy attack because this is a time where we're told that the cupboard is bare for everybody. It doesn't matter that you're rich or poor, it's just there are no resources at all. Cash transfers in general, social protection, and as I said, the European social model, solidarity altogether, are coming under fierce attack. Um, I've heard even from trade unions who say, but we don't have the money right now to pay wages for people who work, and you want to convince us to pay people who don't even work? How is that going to function? So there are a number of, of prejudices that need to be overcome and a number of priorities that need to be set straight because social protection is not a luxury. Social protection is an investment. It's an investment in generation, it's an investment in people, it's an investment in societies, and it's an investment in economies. Now, as, as EAPN, we've had very long discussions and debates about should we go for basic income? Should we go for minimum income? What type of income support is the most adequate right now? And um, the answer was a little bit both, because some of our members, it also, as I said, we have a diverse national membership. The situation is very different in very different countries. Some people in our network are more, some networks are more in favor of a basic income approach, others of a minimum income approach, others of both. Um, it was also said that minimum income responds to immediate needs, to immediate pockets, deep pockets of poverty which exist right now in Europe, whereas basic income is more a, cha a structural, fundamental change of paradigm of how our societies are built, of what work represents and the place that paid employment should occupy, and that this is a more long-term process and objective, whereas there are people who are starving right now. So this is a little bit behind um, the choices we, we had to make. And um, we decided to go more for minimum income as, as, as a concrete action point. And we've done a number of things which I've listed there, a campaign with some support from the ETC. A key, it was a key demand of the European Year Against Poverty. We led lobbying campaigns with a number of European institutions, including the European Parliament. We worked with the Belgian presidency. We have some publications which you can see outside. Um, and what we want is to build support for a new framework directive on minimum income. And for that, we have spoken to lawyers who have ensured us that the legal basis is there and that it is possible to ask the European Union to regulate this at member states level through the means of a directive. Um, I'm going to skip through this slide because I'm sure the presentation will be available to you and, and you'll be able to see the institutional support that is currently there for minimum income. Um, I also want to say that we are leading on a project, a two-year project funded by, the, funded by the European Commission with a number of EU partners and involving EAPN networks to look at the situation of minimum income on the ground, raise awareness, identify obstacles as well as solutions and build consensus on how adequate minimum income schemes should look. To conclude, we have a humanitarian crisis in Europe. I am tired of hearing about the financial crisis, about the economic crisis, about how there is a crisis about everything except about people. There is a human crisis out there, a social and a societal crisis, and it's the one that it's addressed the least. It's a deep recession where the most vulnerable have borne the brunt and are still hit the hardest. In the recovery packages, we have seen a complete failure to respond to the real causes, which is lack of equality, lack of distribution, proper redistribution, income inequality, and, and, and growing cleavages in society between the top and, and the bottom. Loss of respect for human knowledge, for, for human potential, for the individual, for the human being as a whole, and unsustainable forms of capitalism that drive forward an economy which does not, solve, which does not serve the people. In social policy, it is difficult for the European Union to position itself because there is competition rather than cooperation. There is no strong competence for the European Union to intervene in social policy direct directly, but by intervening in economic policy, it shapes in a very dangerous way social policies. We cannot say that the EU does not intervene in social policy because it does, through the back door of economic and employment intervention. 
There is a rise of racism and xenophobia in so many countries and it has shown us maybe for the first time in a long time that Europe is not immune to violence, that democracy is crumbling, we need participation from people and stakeholders and not decisions behind closed doors by, by elites and especially not by financial elites. And we need adequate income support. We need adequate social protection. We need to put people before profit and to, to, re, to give people back hope in the EU. Because right now the EU is synonymous with austerity, it's synonymous with hardship, it's synonymous with hardship, with cuts, with not having the most basic needs fulfilled and the most basic tools to participate in life and in society. And I wish you a very fruitful conference. Thank you very much for listening to me and I hope we'll get there together. Okay, next up, I would like to introduce Ronald Blasky, co-founding member of uh, the Basic Income Network in Germany. Okay, good morning and thank you for the invitation to Brussels. My name is Ronald Blaschke. I'm a member of the board of the network Grundeinkommen in Germany. Uh, my subject is unconditional basic income, an effective means of tackling poverty and hidden poverty and of promoting freedom for all and democracy. Okay, so first you can see some sentences from uh, important protagonists of basic income from Alteo Spinelli. Uh, also from Martin Luther King, also from André Gortz, and from Michael Pielka, Heidrunstal from Germany. I have distributed this paper for everybody. Okay, chapter one, I would give a structure. Chapter one, I will define the terms minimum income and conditional basic income, partial basic income, and so on. Chapter three, uh, two, six, to answer the question of whether an unconditional basic income is an effective means of tackling poverty and hidden poverty, and whether an unconditional basic income promotes freedom for all and democracy. Chapter C seeks to answer the questions with regard to partial basic income. And my presentation will end with a conclusion and forks on how an unconditional basic income form might gradually be introduced. Please note, it's the first of all, I'm speaking about the situation in Europe, not about the situation in the country of the global south, it's a different thing. Okay, in, uh, we have a different opinion about the term of minimum income. I think uh, we have two types of for or forms of minimum income, a basic minimum security provisions, it means in German, Sozialhilfe or uh, social allowance, social assistance, we have different uh, 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 names for this. And the other side, we have the basic income. It's also a form of minimum income. The different, you can see it's the next paper. The basic minimum security provisions are social administrative means tested, not individually granted, associated with forced labor, a breach of human rights, I think so. And uh, it's also associated with forced uh, uh, with services in return. And it's the basic income, uh, the basic securities provisions do not usually guarantee material security and participation in society, in society do not eradicate poverty and hidden poverty. It's a different thing to the basic income you can see here. Um, the unconditional basic income is not means tested, is guaranteed individuality to everyone without pressure to engage in work forced labor or service in return, and it's unconditionally guarantee material security, it means existence and participation in society. It's a different thing, we have two types of minimum income, social allowance or social health in Germany <coughs> or uh, welfare benefits and basic income, unconditional basic income, it's another thing, it's a different thing. Sorry, Ronald, could you kind of speak into the microphone? Oh, before? sorry, yeah. okay. Sorry. Um, we have to note uh, that uh, the European Parliament has stated in a number of resolutions that the poverty risk threshold is 60% of median equalized net income. It means net income. It's without the cost of insurance for health or for uh, older men, 
for a pension and so on. It's net income only. You can see here, where is it? Sorry. You can see some uh, um, examples for poverty threshold in uh, 2014. It's projected, for example, in France, Belgium, Germany, Poland, and Romania. It's a very different level, you know, in uh, Europe. It's logical because uh, the net income is 60% um, uh, is, uh, of the medium income in the country. Yeah? Okay, and when you have a, uh, um, uh, a low level in the country, you have a low uh, threshold of poverty, of course. Oh. Yeah, it's because of the lights in, the, in here. Um, we, what we'll do is we'll make presentations available afterwards, all right, online. So don't worry too much about what's going on up, up above you. Okay. Thank you. And Ronald, if you could speak, Ronald. Yeah. If you could speak into the microphone, people can hear yeah, yeah. you better. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. 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 Um, so next, um, the unconditional basic income Europe network defined UBI is in the same uh, uh, definition. It's a monetary transfer which is universal. It means everyone or everywhere paid to each individual unconditionally and high enough to ensure a dignified <coughs> existence with participation in society. Please note, the European Parliament says and takes a few that the adequate minimum income schemes must set minimum incomes at the level equivalent to at least 60% of median income in the member state concerned. It means also for the basic income. The European Parliament uh, uh, had a resolution uh, in, in, uh, two years ago, I think, and said the European Parliament calls on the Commission and the EU member states to examine how different models of unconditional and poverty precluding basic incomes for all could contribute to social, cultural and political inclusion, taking especially into account where non-stigmatizing stigmatizing character and their ability to prevent cases of concealed poverty. What is concealed poverty? It's very important, or hidden poverty. It's a specialist term for the fact that conditional social cash transfers, like a social allowance, social health in Germany, are stigmatizing and discriminatory, so that people do not claim these benefits and thereby exclude themselves from receiving them. For example, because we are ashamed to be seen as poor because the requirements and constraints that apply to take up of benefits frighten people off, or because the bureaucratic <coughs> obstacles to claiming benefits are too great. In Germany, this is true of about half of all those who would be eligible for supplementary benefits in the form of basic or minimum security provisions. 50 persons non-take-up is a non-take-up rate for basic or minimum security provisions in Germany. 50 persons, persons, sorry. Uh, it should be noted that every person who does not receive the welfare benefits to which is his, he is entitled is in fact the victim of a breach of human and basic rights because he is not getting the welfare benefits he is entitled to receive in order to guarantee his material security and participation in society. You can see uh, the reason, three, season, or three uh, important seasons for um, the hidden poverty here at the page. Next, chapter two. Why is unconditional basic income an effective means of tackling poverty, tackling hidden poverty and promoting freedom for all and democracy? An unconditional basic income gives everyone the assurance of material security and participation in society. If it's topped up to provide adequate health care or health care is available free of charge. This will consistently eradicate income poverty and this, its consequences. 
An unconditional basic income of which everyone is assured with no conditions attached will consistently eradicate hidden poverty. It gets rid of the stigmas and discrimination associated with conditional social cash transfers. Because the unconditional basic income is given to everyone with no conditions attached and at an adequate level, it also consistently combats forced labor. It thus gives everyone the freedom to choose what work they do. It also gives people the power democratically and without economic coercion to play their part in economic and social life and in shaping good living and working conditions. Because the unconditional basic income is guaranteed individually and at sufficiently generous level, it enables everyone to live free of economic dependency or coercion by others, both in the world of work and in their personal lives, in family relationships and partnerships. Why, what about the partial basic income? The partial basic income, the first, <coughs> does not provide the individual with a guarantee of basic material security and participation in society. It does not eradicate income poverty because it's too low. You can see here the definition of partial basic income. It has only three criteria, not four, without the criteria high enough to ensure a material existence and participation in society. The second, about partial basic income, because the partial basic income is too low, the individual is forced to accept a paid job, even one he or she has not freely chosen and which is perhaps badly paid in order to secure his or her livelihood and participation in society. So the partial basic income does not unconditionally guarantee material security and participation in society and does not secure the free reaction or choice of work. The third, even if the partial basic income is combined with or supplemented by other conditional social cash transfers like uh, welfare benefits, it does not unconditionally guarantee material security and participation in society. Because in the absence of an income source or when the partial basic income, the individual is obliged to apply to the offerings for basic or minimum security provisions. Stigmatization and discrimination thus remain a fact of life for many people. Hidden poverty likewise remains a fact of life for many people. Hidden poverty is not eradicated by partial basic income. Conclusion. Because the partial basic income is too low, people continue to be vulnerable to coercion in the world of work, in society and their personal lives and relationships with their partners. The partial basic income does little or nothing for freedom for all and for developing democracy. There are those who argue that the introduction of basic, partial basic income might lead to an unconditional basic income later. But from existing partial basic incomes, there is no empiric evidence that is, this hope is a realistic one. And there is no logical evidence for this hope. In addition, it is not impossible that the introduction of a partial basic income might with a certain balance of political power, might be used to reduce or even abolish pre-existence, existing higher welfare benefits and social minimum standards. That is the opening state, political aim of neoliberal advocates of partial basic income and the tradition of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. We exist, these exist worldwide in Europe and Germany too. Why a partial basic income goes well with neoliberal intentions? In orgs governmental, it orgs government, it orgs back governmental and bureaucratic influence because there is no social administrative means test and no coercion to labor by the welfare office. But it retains or strengthens the economic pressure of market and people. For example, to sell their labor power because it is too low. The possible negative consequences I have described along with where with the lack of positive consequences of partial basic income outlined above, also have the effect of frightening of many potential allies. Conclusions and forks on the way forward. 
I think unconditional basic income eradicates, eradicates income poverty and hidden poverty. It er eradicates forced labor and promotes freedom for all in democracy. Basic or minimum security provisions and partial basic incomes do not eradicate <coughs> hidden poverty. Basic or minimum security provisions and partial basic incomes do not in themselves eradicate income poverty. All we can do, depending on how we are structured, is relieve poverty. So force people to take jobs for economic reasons, even if the working conditions associated with those jobs are bad. Partial basic incomes also force people to apply for additional social transfers, transfers which are discriminatory and stigmatizing. They do not give individuals a guarantee of material security and participation in society. We can be misused as a way of cutting levels of social protection, and when this happens, we are rejected and opposed by potential allies in the basic income movement. Okay, the last one. I think a better way to eradicate poverty and for gradually achieving the objective of universal basic income in Europe, in Europe would be through a Europe-wide action to four proposals or four um, uh, steps. One step is introduce a basic income for all children and young people which adequate in the context of each country. The next step is to abolish forced labor in the case of existing basic or minimum security provisions and individualize these benefits, increasing them immediately to the level of poverty risk threshold for the country concerned or values based on the basket of goods and service. The next step maybe is to introduce non-means-tested transfers for employees taking a break from work. It means a basic income for, um, um, for sabbatical the name in Germany, which are adequate in the context of each country. And another step is to introduce a basic pension for all older people that is adequate also in the context of each country. All these are steps pertinent to different lifetime stages towards an unconditional basic income for all. We are broadly support supported by the general public and enable social alliances with social movements trade unions, welfare associations, churches, and political parties. These steps help to increase the acceptance of unconditional basic income within, within society. A merging of these transfers and a further reduction of conditions are leading to unconditional basic income for all people in country and in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, thank you for your attention. Thank you.